Welcome to the J Max Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Maxwell, and today I'm joined by special guest, Ben Pakalski. Ben is an IFBB pro and has dedicated his career to knowledge and education. He's competed in the highest level bodybuilding competitions, such as the Mr. Olympia and the Arnold Classic. People who follow Ben's methods discover new and more efficient ways to grow muscle that no one else can teach them. And that's why I asked Ben to be on the show today. Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate being here, man. So to get started, I was talking to Vince Del Monte a couple of weeks ago, one of our mutual friends, and he said that you guys went to Western University together. And he told me that you were always like the biggest and probably the most insane guy in the gym <laughs> doing 10 sets of 10 on your legs. Uh, what was going through your head at this time and what was your motivation? Uh, you know, interesting, man. I have my own podcast and I recorded one yesterday with a guy who was kind of a role model for me growing up. His name is Stan Efferding. Um, you may or may not know him. Uh, yeah, as, as, yeah, the white rhino. Um, he's the strongest bodybuilder ever um, and also one of the world's strongest men as far as powerlifters. And uh, I have a conversation with him about what work ethic was back in the 80s and 90s. And so I grew up reading bodybuilding magazines. Uh, you know, in the mid to late 90s. And my perception of what hard work was, was uh, like uh, blowing away what people perceive to be hard work now. And uh, I always grew up with the attitude of the pro bodybuilders in the world are the hardest working guys by far. And that's how they get as big as they are. You know, and that's all I knew. You know, being from Canada might have been a blessing. Um, you know, the fact that I didn't get any exposure to any other pro bodybuilders, I just said, man, well, what I saw in the magazines, because there's no internet, um, you know, what I saw in the magazines was these guys were just massive making these big screaming faces. So I assumed that they were working that hard. Uh, and that's what I learned, man, from the time I was 15 years old, that uh, if I wanted to, to be a muscular human, I needed to work hard. And uh, that's kind of what pushed me into being, you know, having that reputation in university. Um, it's, it's, it is true. I mean, when I went to first year university, m my growth happened pretty quickly, man. So I started training. I was 15. I was 150 pounds. I was a long distance runner and a vegetarian. Uh, and then I, I stopped running and started eating meat. And I actually started training twice a day almost immediately. Um, and I went from about 150 to 210, uh, but well, no, 150 to 195 in the first six months. And the first 18 months, I went to about 230. So I put, put on about 80 pounds in 18 months. And I was all natural. Everybody goes, well, what were you using? I was like, I mean, I was all natural as a kid, right? I just was, was training hard and I knew what hard work was. And it, ironically, they used to call me the little screamer boy in the gym I trained at because I was 16 years old. And I was just, you know, I, that's all I knew. I was screaming. I was trying to lift stuff that I probably couldn't and, and probably shouldn't. But, um, you know, that's how I learned effort and intensity. I had some very great role models from a young age. Um, and then going to university, I went in about 260 pounds and I was lean. I mean, I was certainly under 10%. You know, I was probably squatting at 19 years old. I was squatting over 600, um, you know, deadlifting over 600. Uh, and I went into that school kind of knowing that I was the strongest guy and maybe the biggest guy, or at least maybe I didn't know that, but I thought that. And, uh, I, you know, I guess, yeah, I just wouldn't let anything affect my workouts in any way, right? I, I love to train, and, and that was my tunnel vision at the time, and it was kind of my outlet, and I guess I developed the reputation. <laughs> so, are you still the screamer? No, man, I'm, I'm complete opposite now. Sometimes, sometimes I let them out, but I, I actually try to be more meditative in my training now. So, one thing I discovered... I actually discovered this in university, but I didn't know what to do with it at the time, was I have this genetic uh, predisposition to where I get amped up. So my body releases norepinephrine, and, and, which is adrenaline, and it doesn't recycle it, so it stays really amped up. So I get when I get amped up in a workout or if I get if I get in a fight or, you know, if I, if I get really like, nervous, my adrenaline goes up and it stays up. And if you know anything about how cortisol and adrenaline work, if they're elevated for too long, you get really tired. So you burn out really quick. So I found in like my first and second year university that I could have really intense workouts for like 20 or 30 minutes and then I was cooked. I was like, what the hell is the matter with me? Like I wasn't tired. My lungs weren't tired. I just felt like I had no more energy. So I started listening to meditative, like classical music, believe it or not, or like uh, like meditative type music in university when I was training and people go, what the hell are you doing, man? Everybody else is listening to death metal. I'm listening to literally like classical, like really metal, mellow stuff. And everybody thought I was crazy, but it allowed me to stay 
uh, a little more like subdued between sets while I while I extended the amount of work I was doing. So something I discovered a long time ago, and only recently in like the last three years have I actually realized that it's actually a genetic thing um, where my body doesn't recycle catecholamines and I have to take a supplement. I take um, something called TMG trimethylglycine, which is just a you know one of the one of the precursors in that pathway to kind of allow myself to, to stay normal when when I get excited about stuff. And it's ironic my son has the same thing. And you, know, you see him getting I checked his genetics his genes you see him getting amped up and he gets really like he just gets like anxious you know he can't calm down i don't know if mine was anxious but it was uh you know a fight or flight kind of thing Mm -hmm. it's interesting you mentioned the classical music because i know a couple other bodybuilders are using tracks from movies like uh lane norton listens to Hans zimmer who wrote like the music for interstellar and a bunch of other and yeah, so honest, honestly, man, I'm in my gym right now, and when I train, it's always on epic, epic tracks on on Pandora. You know, uh, that's all it is because I can't deal with people. I don't want lyrics. I can't have anything with lyrics. So my music is always um, epic tracks or some type of music with the lyrics removed. So you said that bodybuilders, pro bodybuilders, they are the hardest working, and you started working harder. So and that harder was my and perception. Oh, that was your perception. Okay. Yeah, when I was a kid. Yep. All right. So what changed that perception? Training with them. Okay. And you know, uh, honestly, so you realize that the pro bodybuilders aren't necessarily the hardest working. Most often they're the most genetically gifted. Um, and, and that just from uh, predisposition of building muscle, don't get me wrong. They work hard, man. Pros work harder than everybody else. That's inevitable, but they didn't, work, they don't work as hard as I thought. You know, I thought every workout was just like to the death to the point you couldn't stand stand up to the point like you're you're falling over it's not that it's not necessary to do that in most cases um but that was my perception when i was a kid okay um one thing i've thought too is pro bodybuilders they seem to you know they're genetically able to build more muscle but a lot of them seem to have this ability to push through pain more than uh just a regular person do you find that as well it's a learned trait, man. That's a learned trait. So like anything, right? When you start something, it's hard. Um, you know, whether it be a new habit, whether it be whatever it happens to be, it's hard. And and mentally, you're not used to it. It becomes a difficult thing. Um, as you kind of become, you subject yourself to it more, it just becomes a little bit easier. It becomes, you know, almost second nature. Um, and that was one thing that I was very blessed with in the beginning. I had some really incredible training partners uh, who understood, or at least who selflessly tried to take me to my my limit? Um, you know, maybe they were them just just trying to inflict pain on me, or maybe it was them selflessly actually trying to help help me. But um, you know, I learned what work ethic was from a very young age. Okay, so you also mentioned you were training twice a day, and that's when you gained a ton of mass naturally. Um, how do you go about twice a day training? Well, what I go about now, how I go about it now and how I went about it then is really different. Back then it was just, I just left the train, man. So I went to the gym. I probably ended up doing the same exercises both morning and night. Didn't know any different. Um, but I just, you know, woke up in the morning before school. I went to train and I got a good 45 minutes to an hour in. And uh, and then on the way after school, you know, I actually stopped playing sports for, well, I still played sports, but, you know, I I, I, I put some of them on the back burner because I was very athletic as a kid. I stopped playing as many sports. Uh, and just, you know, right after school, I, I went to the gym and I trained and, you know, what did it look like? I honestly don't remember, but I, I remember there was, uh, you know, it, it was often just like what I saw my, my training partner doing or what I like to do. Mm-hmm. So what do you do now when you program twice a day training? So now, obviously now it'll be a lot more specific. Um, so the the research of the science and the logic would go as such um the morning would be more of a neurological type workout which means kind of strength base with the objective of exciting your nervous system so a certain uh, percentage of your maximum load will have an excitatory effect on the nervous system and you almost get an upregulation of your nervous system's ability to contract muscle so what you're looking for so what that'll have what that'll um cause to happen is you'll get an increased recruitment of the fast twitch motor motor neurons which most people are familiar with um so you'll get this um improved output from the morning trainings the stimulatory training and the afternoon training or the evening training which is usually somewhere between four to six hours later will be hypertrophy based which is like uh you know a little bit more volume a little shorter rest periods uh, a little less load but really more specific muscular contraction 
Okay. In the morning, what would that look like in terms of sets and reps and even loading? You know, man, everyone attaches themselves to sets and reps, and I think it's it would be ignorant of me to say uh, what someone should be doing. And the answer is um, whatever you're capable of. So, you know, what can you do with perfect form? Um, for you, it may be three sets. For me, it may be 12, um, depending on where's your ability right now as far as execution. Most people kind of disregard execution and go straight for the sets and reps. And the truth is, man, if your execution is not there, nothing you do matters. Uh, so that's why I've taken you know the better part of the last six years um, and just like focus my attention on teaching people execution. And I've literally turned it into, uh, uh, you know, the biggest execution uh business and on the internet in the world um because it's such a gap and people just you know i always say it all starts with execution it doesn't matter what you eat it doesn't matter how many sets it doesn't matter how many reps uh, if they all suck you know it, it has to be directing tension with laser-like precision to the right muscle and it sounds complicated it sounds difficult it's really not it's actually quite simple but it's not common sense so we're trying to make it more of a commonplace um, in the industry okay Let's talk about that a bit more. Are there certain exercises that you see people people butchering more than others or ones that you really need to teach people? Everything, man. Um, honestly, like you got strong body parts, I've got strong body parts. A strong body part, from my perspective, means your body naturally knows how to do it well. Maybe you mechanically have an advantage. Maybe your body shape just kind of suits itself for doing a specific exercise really well and that becomes a strong body part. But um, you know, that's one you just naturally pick up. You don't have to think about it. You get it. And then every other body part, for most people, suck. And, um, you know, you don't feel it or you end up hurting something or, you know, your elbows hurt or your knees hurt or your shoulders. And you kind of just don't get it. So learning how to set your body up to mechanically use the muscle you're trying to work is really the objective. Um, so that's kind of where it goes is, is you know, um, it's hard for me to pinpoint one exercise. Uh, it's more just like a broad stroke. If it's not your strong body part, chances are it's a weak body part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually interesting because for me, my legs are always growing way faster than the rest of my body. And when it really came down to it, I figured it out that when I do a leg exercise, I can feel my leg, my legs, all the muscles contracting super, super hard. But when it came to doing something like my chest, it was hard for me to feel the actual tension going through the muscle. So actually, I was watching some of your videos and taking some of the pointers out of there to being able to actually contract it. And that made just a huge difference, just the little bit of execution of putting the tension in. So and you wouldn't even know why, right? You look at it and you go, man, I just feel my legs better and I don't know why. But there's, there's reasons, you know, mechanically, you probably have slightly shorter femurs. Um, you know, you fold into exercises a little bit better. Maybe you have better hip mobility, better ankle mobility. So you can squat down and it kind of feels comfortable for you. Or if someone has really long femurs, the squat's never going to feel good. They're always going to feel it in the lower back. And then maybe they don't want to train their legs as much because they don't feel it. Whereas your chest, you maybe have a flatter rib cage. So when you get into a bench press, you really can't feel it. Whereas some guys may have a really barrel rib cage and they're going to feel the bench press really well. So you don't understand the mechanical differences there. And that's kind of what I've made my business to, to do is teach people, well, this is what you're mechanically predisposed to. And here's how to set it up so you do feel it well. It's really quite simple. Uh, once you understand a few very, very simple uh, truths about mechanics, right? Like your body's going to have a predisposition to building certain body parts. But all that means is it has a predisposition to putting tension through certain body parts, certain ones you just don't feel. And it's not because your dad had big pecs and your mom had big calves or whatever it is. It, you know, all your body, all your muscle fibers in your body are exactly the same. Um, you know, so all it is, is my body has a predisposition to putting tension through certain body parts and not through others. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's go back to your talking about opening up your old flex magazines. Um, I remember a story about how you, oh, you saw the cover and you're like, I never want to be that big, but now you obviously are that big. So what was it that made you change your mind? Nothing. Never did change. Uh, it always was a progression. So it wasn't one day when I woke up and I was like, okay, well, now I want to look like that, right? It was, you know, I started at 150 pounds and at first it was like, well, I want to have abs and I want to look like a fitness model. And then I was 17 and I was like, well, I kind of look like that now. Well, I'm not happy with the way I look. I want to keep pushing. I want this to be a little bigger, this to be a little bigger. 
Um, and then, you know, that happened and, and I grew fast and then I was still like, well, I'd like this to be a little bit better and that to be a little bit better. And, you know, I went through university and I, I got pretty big um, and it wasn't even a goal at that point. I mean, maybe somewhere down the road, I thought about competing and, and being a pro, but it wasn't like, you know, this is all I want to do. Uh, it, you know, it's like my, what I love to do was my habit, um, hobby. Um, and then I finished school and I competed because I wanted to get in shape. I needed an external goal, right? I was like, I, I need something to kind of focus my mind on. Um, so I competed within you know six months of, of finishing university and I won and kind of the rest is history. That's awesome. Um, even going back in that time, I, I remember reading a story about how you were saying that your dad taught you that you need to build the base of the legs and the shoulders. And you have some of the best legs in bodybuilding. But can we talk a little bit more about your dad? Uh, obviously, he was uh, an influence on you. What was the biggest lesson you learned from him? Man, I don't know that my dad was a big influence on my career. Um, you know, I, w one of the stories I did tell was how he used to tell me stories of his glory day about um, you know his training legs and his training shoulders. And to be honest, for me, those were my two weakest body parts when I started training, or at least my uh, developmentally weak body parts. You know, I used to get criticized all the time, and, and people, I, like if I told somebody, hey, you know, I want to be a bodybuilder, they would say, man, you'll never do it because you have no quad sweep and you have narrow shoulders. I got that all the time, and now you're looking back, you're like, somebody actually said that about you, and it's the absolute truth. And not only one, it was more than one person. Um, so, you know, with respect to my dad, like I say, he used to tell me stories when he was in high school, he was a football player and he would say, you know, when I used to do the leg press, I would do this much weight. And I used to be shoulder press and I would do this much weight. And so he would tell me glory stories about the shoulders. So maybe mechanically and genetically, there's some predisposition there to the building those body parts. But then again, my dad also has like zero muscle on his body. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean. I don't know that. It, so as far as building the foundation, um, it was a different person that actually mentioned that to me from the beginning, but you're on the right track. All right. So who was that? Uh, guy I used to train with, man. When I, when I started training, I was 15. I was training at a YMCA, and then I went to a gym called Max Gym, which unfortunately is now closed. The gentleman passed away. Um, guy's name was Bernie, and, and Bernie used to just always say, man, he was an Olympic lifter, and he used to say, man, you got to squat, you got to deadlift. Like you can't, you know, it's just the idea of that I use in the gym is you can't fire a cannon from a canoe and you got to have a strong base if you want to have a strong top. And, it, you know, to me, that just kind of resonated. And we used to do squats two to three times a week. And it was never really on a schedule, man. I'd go to the gym and I'd just kind of go see who was there. And if somebody was squatting, I'd squat. And, and I would never just go and just train quads. I'd be like, hey, man, you know, if you're squatting, I'll squat. Then I'll go train some biceps and I'll go train some shoulders. And it was more just like, hey, man, I love to do it. So, um, you know, I became a great squatter. I became a great deadlifter, maybe because I just did it so often. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised looking back if I was squatting three and four days a week. And people go, oh, it's overtraining. It's not overtraining, man. If I'm 17, 16, 17 years old, that doesn't exist. All that exists at that point is, is under eating, right? So I was certainly eating enough and, and sleeping well. And, um, you know, my body just did what I asked it to do. That's unbelievable. Have you ever Googled yourself recently? No. What does okay. it say? When you Google yourself, you know how they give a suggestion. The first suggestion that pops up is Ben Pakulski calves. So obviously I think you have some of the best calves in bodybuilding, if not the best of all time. What's the story about how you built them? Um, I was reading a 1997 issue of Flex magazine and it had Dorian Yates, um, feature so there's six ten pictures of Dorian Yates and one of them had him on a calf raise um, I don't even know he was on the calf raise but he was staying behind the calf raise kind of doing a calf raise like on, up under his toes showing his calves and I saw his hamstrings and his calves and I was just blown away and I'd never seen anything like it before in my life and I was fascinated because so many of the body like everybody's got big arms everybody's got big chest everybody's got big shoulders but not very many guys had big calves and big legs so I looked at Dorian's legs and I was like I literally on the spot remember ripping it out and I put it in my school bag I probably put it in a binder so it didn't get folded or anything ripped or anything and uh, I took it to the gym with me and I hung it in front of the in front of the calf raises I don't know if I hung it there at first I think I actually carried it around with me so I could stare it because I remember staring at it at school. But uh, eventually I ended up just hanging in front of – there was three calf machines. There was a, a seated calf and there was a donkey calf and a standing calf. And I lived on the seated and the donkey calf, man. Like if anybody was on it, I'd kick him off. But, like that's you know, it's my machine because I had my picture of Dorian right there. And I just literally stared at it and pictured what it would look like, man. And whenever that pain came up, 
I just envisioned myself as Dorian Yates and, uh, you know, what those calves look like and how am I going to get those calves? My calves responded pretty quickly, man. I mean, my dad's got pretty big calves. My mom's family has pretty big calves, but I was skinny. So like, when I started, I didn't have any calves, but they responded really, really fast. As so did my quads. So is that something that you like to do a lot? You really picture yourself with that change? I think it's one of the, the, the keys to my, you know, relative success. Um, I always had a vision board, man. I always, it's something even before I knew what a vision board was, I always had a vision board. I had a court board and I put pictures of the physiques that I wanted to look like um, and bits and pieces, right? You know, body parts. Um, you know, I put pictures of the house I want to live in, the car I want to drive. I always did that before I knew what, what that stuff was. Um, but definitely, I think, honestly, it's something I got away from. It's a unique perspective where when you kind of start becoming one of the best guys in the world not that i am not to my horn but you, you don't want to compare yourself to the best guys in the world because you you want to see yourself as being better than them so it was hard for me to conceptualize like whose body part i wanted to because you know see what i'm saying so like i wanted to compare myself against me now i didn't want to compare myself against anybody else so i started losing that external perspective or maybe that external motivation uh it was interesting when i got when i went pro man or, or at least once i started kind of to ascend the ranks of, of a pro um i, I kind of you know dorian was really and dorian and jay cutler were kind of the only two guys that i was like you know these are the guys that i aspire to to look like um, and what about your quads and hams? Because you have some of the best quads and hams in bodybuilding as well. Um, did you have a vision board for, for that as well? Or did you just go about something, another alternative method? I did. Uh, Dorian was my guy, man. I always believed Dorian's legs to be the best. There was another guy named Tom Prince whose hamstrings are just obscene. Um, but I think my calf or my leg development was more a result of my... Uh, desire, my internal fire to, to be the hardest working guy in the IFBB. So I had this vision of me moving to Venice, California, and I had this vision from the time I was maybe 21, not 20, uh, moving to Venice, California and, and developing a reputation for being the hardest working guy in the gym. And um, like I wanted everyone to respect me because I honestly didn't know that I had what it took. I thought I believe, I thought I had what it took, but I didn't know. Like I didn't know that I could ever be pro. But uh, I knew I could be a good bodybuilder, and uh, I wanted to have that reputation for being the hardest working bodybuilder that anyone's ever trained with. Um, so when I went to Venice for the first time, I remember like specifically seeing Charles Glass behind me in the mirror, and I was doing legs, and I just wouldn't stop, man. Like I just was like, I want him to know, I want him to recognize, I want him to talk about me when I'm not there. You know that kind of that kind of thought. Uh, so that's kind of where my leg development came from, as this internal drive to uh, just leave my mark. That's great. I love that. Um, so how has your training approach evolved over the past decade? Uh, way more specific, and um, I can get a lot more done in a lot less time because it's a lot less wasted effort. Um, so. You know, that's that's why I lean so much toward execution. You know, I've made a lot of mistakes over the last 20 years of training. And uh, you realize that, like, man, if I would have just, like, focused on execution for the first two to three years, less regard for effort, less regard for load, and actually just kind of ingrained in my nervous system how to do it, how to do these things, the load would naturally build itself. Uh, and I'd be so much further ahead with so fewer injuries and, uh, you know, probably a lot more balanced physique. But we're so attached to numbers, we're so attached to exercises and having to bench a certain amount and having to squat a certain amount that it was probably my, my Achilles heel, man. So over the last, you know, really six years, maybe seven years now, um, I've really um, placed a lot of my focus on mastering my execution. Um, and I say quote with that with quotations because um, it's always a kind of a journey, man. It's always evolving. Um, you know, I believe I can have what is effectively perfect execution today, but that may, I may lose that. So if you don't train for very, for a while, it goes away. And it's always kind of this constant battle to train your nervous system and train your body to do things as close to perfect as possible. So what was the thing that made you realize that this execution is so important? Um, a lot of things, man, injuries. <laughs> Um, uh, the, so the biggest catalyst, man, and I've told this story before, um, I got my pro card in 2008, did a pro show in 2009, did really, really well, 
and I was like, uh, I was so motivated, man. I was like a bloodthirsty lion after that show. I got third place, my first pro show, competing against Dennis James, who was one of my childhood heroes. And I, nothing could stop me, man. I didn't talk to anyone for six months. I, all I did was eat, sleep, and train. I was so focused. Like, I'm going to crush this next show. I'm going to go in and win. It literally lit a fire that I didn't know I had. And uh, I trained twice a day every day for eight months. I put on 17 pounds of stage weight. Actually, probably more like 22 pounds of stage weight because I was actually leaner as well in eight months. And for me, that was incredible. And I went on stage. I think I was like 260 uh, in 2010. And I did extremely poorly uh, by my standards. I went in with the intent of, of winning or at least getting top two, and I got seventh. And it, it crushed me, man. And, I, and I, I at first was you know blaming, and I was like everybody else, going, "Well, the judges, it's subjective." And then I took a step back a couple of weeks later and I looked at the pictures, and I wasn't happy with what I saw. And I was like, "Oh, well, that was too big, and that was too small. Body parts, you know, you know certain body parts were getting really, really big, and certain ones were getting really, weren't getting bigger at all." Um, so, you know, I kind of objectively said, well, what's causing that? So certain ones are getting really big and certain ones are getting small. Well, I know my execution on that's really good because I feel that body part really well. And the other ones, oh, I don't really feel as well. I'm using really heavy loads, but I don't, I'm not really growing really well. I'm getting, you know, sore elbows. I'm getting sore shoulders. Um, but I'm not really building the same amount of muscle. So it kind of made me realize that hard work wasn't the answer all the time. Um, you know, you reach a certain point where I was probably pretty damn maxed out genetically on how big I was going to be. And you realized that certain body parts were, were great. You know, certain body parts, my, my brain just got it. And certain ones were, you know, left something to be desired. So I, I took a step back and I said, well, is that all I've got? You know, is that all I've got genetically? Is that is that maybe why I can't build it? And then you start to realize, well, it's all the same muscle fiber. Why can't I build that muscle? And you realize, well, I don't feel that muscle as well. What can make me feel that muscle better? So I started focus, shifting my focus to really mastering, you know, that, that contraction of those muscles. And they just started to grow with less load. And uh, yeah, that was the, big, the biggest realization for me was you can build muscle with less load because ultimately, man, muscles communicate in terms of tension. Muscles don't know how much load you're lifting. They know tension. So if you can figure out a way to increase the amount of tension going through a specific part of the muscle or a specific muscle, you have a better result. So tension can be a result of more load obviously, but it can also be a result of perhaps using less surrounding muscles or having really, really specifically applied tension, right? So, you know, if I'm doing a bench press, how much of the, how, what percentage of the load is going through my pec versus how much is going through my delt versus how much is going through my tricep? And people don't realize that those factors are manipulable, right? I can change those. Um, so I learned how to manipulate um, how to put the greatest amount of tension with less load through a muscle, mastered execution, and then progress my loads back up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So you mentioned um, you gained 17 to 22 pounds of muscle stage weight when you were super focused and driven. When was the last time you felt that drive? Then. Then? That was uh, the hardest? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, for sure that was the hardest. Um, things changed, man. Uh, and I've, I've told this story before too, is, um, you know, 2011, uh, I was living in LA, training at a Gold's, living the bodybuilder dream. Um, and then I uh, thought I was on my way to competing in 10 Mr. Olympia contests, you know, winning my five or six and then retiring as a, um, you know, a Mr. reigning Mr. Olympia. Uh, and then I had a child. And things change, man. Your, your motivations shift. Um, your priorities change. You can't be 100% selfish anymore. Um, so, you know, I still love to train and it's still an amazing part of my life, but it can no longer be 100% about me. And, uh, you know, that is what it is, man. I mean, my children are my greatest blessing in my life. They're my greatest teachers and my greatest companions. Um, and, I couldn't ever imagine going back to the point where I was ruthless, man. In 2010, 2011, like, I was, uh, nothing was going to get in my way, man. I'll run through walls to do what I need to accomplish, which is why I had so much success in 2011, 12, 13, even 14, because uh, it was still kind of residual. And now it's obviously, um, 
my my priorities have shifted, man. You know, I've realized I have a, I have a greater purpose in helping people and teaching people to achieve their uh, maximum human performance, to achieve their greatest self. Uh, so I've moved on to doing. I mean, I'm still competing. Don't get me wrong, but um, it's just with a different focus. And you know, it's also the blessing that I have the ability now to train harder with uh, less time. So because I can get so much more done in so much less time. Um, because of my execution ability now, my ability to manipulate the variables of exercise, I don't need as much time. But it's still, to be one of the best in the world at anything, man, you could imagine, it takes time, it takes focus, it takes uh, sacrifices. I'm just, I'm, honestly, man, I can't sacrifice the first years of my children's life f- to be selflessly build my muscle. You know, I just, nothing in my brain says that makes sense. Mm-hmm. The greater good. Yeah. So what do you hope that, your children when they become adults what do you hope they can learn from you man you know one of my one of my best friends um kind of put something in my head a long time ago i think it was even before i had kids he's got four kids he said um all i want is when my kids grow up instead of idolizing superman or spider-man or batman when you say you know who's your who do you look up to or who's your favorite superhero i want them to say my dad and that, that's ultimately the same for me, man, is, um, you know, I want to teach them integrity. I want to teach them work ethic. Um, and I want to teach them that they're loved unconditionally, man. And, and uh, you know, nothing they say or do is ever going to be taken out of context. Um, you know, for the, for the rest of my life, they're my greatest priority. Mm-hmm. I'm with you on that. I have the same feelings on that. That's cool. Yeah, um, kids, man. Not yet, but when yeah. I when I do, that's it that's cha- the changes, feeling. man. I'll tell you what, like you can think all you want, but once you experience, it's a whole different game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard. Um, so, in your bodybuilding career, what accomplishment or accomplishments are you most proud of? Um, you know, most people presume it is. The, I got second place at the Arnold in 2013. Uh, in actuality, it's probably my fourth place finish in 2012 um i worked hard for that show um that was probably the hardest i'd ever worked i made a tremendous amount of progress and i was really happy with the way that it looked i didn't think i was perfect i think i could have been a little bit better um but i was really happy that was the most happy i've ever been uh 2013 when i got second uh, three separate times in the last six weeks or maybe the last 10 weeks I was that close to quitting uh, I was sick uh, I had a bunch of stress in my life I had a bunch of stuff and I was like forget it my, my, my wife was pregnant uh, I was like I don't need to do this show I'm not going to do it and literally the night before the show I almost quit and I was never been so close to quitting in my life but I'm not a quitter man I've never quit anything won't get into the story as to why but I was sick I was very very sick you know throwing up uh, profusely um, you know diarrhea the whole bit like literally every 45 minutes on the hour and I hadn't eaten in probably by the end of the show Saturday night almost 48 hours I hadn't touched any food um, so I was literally I couldn't see straight I was just a mess I got some food poisoning and uh, still managed to, to suck it up and go on stage and uh, managed to get second place man I mean I was obviously looking great but you never really you never want to go on stage and not feel like you're your best it's never a victory man if I would have won that show it probably would have been you know, obviously it would have been great, but knowing that I wasn't at my best, I may not have felt like I, I deserved it. Mm-hmm. So I thought, uh, I figured a lot of people would think that you would say the Olympia, just being in the Olympia. Um, can we talk about the Olympia? Of course. Um, I'll tell you what, man. Yeah, I had some, I had some um, childhood dreams realized by competing in the Olympia, you know, the idea of walking on stage. One of the things that I always wanted, I went to the Olympia for the first time in 98. I was 17. I just saw it in a magazine. I was like, hey, dad, could we go to this? He's like, sure. Um, and I saw them all wearing these Olympia track suits. And I was like, man, like, that's cool. And I always wanted Olympia track suits. So I managed to get two of those. That was cool. Uh, going on stage, the Olympia, man, I honestly don't know that I saw as that much of a different uh, show. I'm pretty non-externally motivated um like i don't i'm not motivated by placings particularly um i'm more motivated by already beating myself so whether i got like you know whether i got first place or or 10th place was not the biggest concern for me as much as i wanted to win i was like i would have been much happier 
um, just knowing that I was like, I, I never missed a rep. I never missed a cardio. I never missed a meal. Like that to me was my motivation rather than like, oh, great. I got first at the Vancouver Pro. Like, it doesn't matter to me. Man. I don't care. Like at first, third, doesn't matter to me. It's all, I, I don't have an attachment to the placing. So um, yeah, the Olympia was great uh, from an experience perspective. Um, to say that I did it, you know, twice was awesome. But uh, I think, you know, I enjoy the Arnold Classics actually more. Okay. So when you're backstage before a show, before you go on stage, how are you prepping physically and mentally? Visualization, man. I've been a guy who visualizes since I was 18 years old. So if anyone hasn't seen my, my um, video, the debut, that's available on my website. Uh, when I actually competed in the Olympia in 2012, um, literally my whole journey, like, so I had a video guy come with me for the last week and, and follow me and my family. I had a son at the time, um, you know, through training, through traveling to the Olympia, inside the hotel room, backstage, all the stuff it was super cool. Really, really well produced video. The guy did a great job. I had absolutely no hand in that whatsoever. I just showed up. I did a very good job. Um, so yeah, like, it's called the debut. It's available on my website. And, uh, yeah, what am I, I'm meditating, man. I'm, I'm visualizing, uh, trying to be calm so stress at that level is massive and and you like I said I have that predisposition to getting like amped up so if I get excited about something I can't come back down so I try to just keep myself meditation is a huge part of my life now for that reason man it's like I have to keep myself like you know chilled out um, so I just lay back there man I visualize uh, I try to keep my body temperature down um, yeah man just stay as chilled out as I can visualizing what it's going to look like um, you know, every time I step on stage, um, I remember my first bodybuilding show where I think I was 17 and I was sitting, in, you know, effectively in the back and watching and being like, wow, you know, I, I, I will never look like that. I could only imagine having a fraction of that muscle. And now I'm that guy. So I, I'm posing to that kid in the back who this may be his first time seeing a show or I mean, I may be his favorite bodybuilder. And I'm up there posing him, so it's absolute confidence, it's absolute uh, joy for me to be up on stage because I want to influence people in the right way. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like a circle of life almost. So science and research has come a long way since the 70s and 80s. Um, and then in untested shows, what kind of performance enhancing drugs are pro bodybuilders still using since the 70s and 80s, or how has that changed? Sorry, uh, ask that question one more time. You say untested show, uh, like so, uh, non-drug tested shows. Yeah, non-drug tested shows. We're talking performance enhancing drugs. Compared to the seventies and eighties. Yeah, I don't know if I have a means of comparison, man. I don't know what they're doing. I wasn't alive, so I couldn't tell you. Um, you know, I could speculate, but that would be ignorant. So uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. Okay, and um, so what, what kind of things are have you seen, guys? using now compared to like five years ago or is there any of that changed man uh you know i think the, the misconception is that um i'll you know blatantly address the biggest misconceptions is most people have this conception that pro bodybuilders are the guys abusing drugs and from my experience it's not the case man it's the guys who aren't the pro bodybuilders who are trying to get there who are the ones abusing drugs because they don't have the genetics or the work ethic uh, or the commitment or the persistence or all these other things that it takes to, to be one of the best. Um, and the guys who are at the top, from my experience, very few of them are abusing anything. And don't get me wrong, I don't know. Like, I'm not with them every day. I'm not holding their hand. I'm not, you know. But uh, from my perspective, what I see, what I observe, um, I think that the perception is wrong, man. And I'm usually the guy I call a spade a spade, right? Like, there's obviously going to be some guys abusing a bunch of shit, but... Um, the best guys in the world are the guys who don't ben who benefit from nothing or the smallest of, of amounts. And you know, a lot of guys are obviously doing testosterone replacement therapy, but it's all legit done through the doctor at like dosage that, that that's called therapeutic. But for them, it works, man. And, and like you know, there's guys that I know. I'm not going to name names, but I know they have testosterone levels naturally that are off the charts. Um, it's just genetic, man. Like you know, some guys touch a weight and they grow, and some guys don't. Uh, I mean, there's a huge genetic component to what we do. I honestly always say that I was probably of the least genetically blessed. But that doesn't mean that I'm not better than 95% of the population out there. I just suck compared to the guys I'm competing against, man. These guys are just like freaks of nature. When you watch them train, they do nothing. They're very minimal amount of stimulus. And you're like, how the hell do they get so big? 
you know, whereas me, it was like I had to do everything perfectly to get any semblance of that. But, um, you know, it, it's still a, still a continuum. I'm still better than 98 percent of the population of the world. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I remember reading Robbie Robinson's book and he said before his first Olympia, he didn't do any drugs until like two to three weeks out, which doesn't really give you enough time to build like uh, to benefit really from it. So, which is pretty fantastic. Um, and it just goes to show like a lot of the pros, they don't need as much as, uh, as people think, man, you know, it all gets out of, out of proportion with the message boards and shit. And like, I know people used to make, uh, make up stories about me and like what I was doing. And I was like, where do these things come from? Who makes these things up? Um, who really knows? You know, I, I, I really don't know, but people sitting at home, you know, speculating what I take or what Kai Green takes or whatever. And, you know, because they're taking some ridiculous amount themselves and not getting the same results and they don't look the way we do, they presume we, we're taking more by deductive reasoning. But it's just, it's just a dislog- it's a mislogic, right? Like, how about getting your ass in the gym and busting your ass? Come work out with me one time. See what happens, right? Like, you'll last – most honestly, most guys come train with me don't even make it through the first exercise. And I'm old now, man. Like, I, you know, I'm 36 I'm not old, but like, you know, some of these guys come 25, 26 and I'll be like, all right, man, like, you know, you make it through the, through the first exercise, you can come back. If not, you don't ever come back kind of thing, you know, and most of them don't. Uh, and not to be arrogant, but that's just the reality, man. I mean, it might, <laughs> it's just what it is. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of those things where they're like, well, I'm not that big. So it's kind of like their cop out of saying, well, it's got to be the drugs. It's got to be this. Yeah. It's yeah. like how you were saying when you, uh, you lost one of, or you didn't place as well as in one of the shows as as you wanted to, and you start. You were saying at first, oh, it was the judging, it was this, but then after some self reflection, you realized, no, it wasn't. Right. Yeah, man. Everyone tries to place the blame externally, right? And now the, the big term that we throw around a lot is, you know, you take ownership for your life. You take accountability for everything, man. And, and that's one thing that I insist on in my life is, you know, with myself and with my kids is no matter what you do, you take ownership in that. If you do something wrong, you say, yes, I did. Uh, if you don't accomplish something you said, oh, you say, yes, that was my fault. That was my responsibility. Nobody else is, man. Nobody else is controlling your life. Mm-hmm. Um, so moving on to a little bit of a exercise and uh, muscle building techniques. I've read both your programs, MI40 and MI40X, both great programs. MI40X was the advanced version of that program. Um, Can we talk about specifically some of the techniques that you implored in uh, MI40X and is there anything differently that you're doing now? Yeah, so in 2011, I came out with my original MI40 foundation product just to kind of start laying the foundation for people who have maybe less than three years of training uh, less than you know, three to five years of training who aren't getting the results they want or maybe they have sore joints or maybe they, they have a weak body part. And that's kind of you know the foundational program for learning execution, learning basic nutrition principles, which is all focused around what you do around the workout. Um, and then it started introducing the idea of, um, you know, how do you know when you've done enough to build muscle and you don't? Um, so I started introducing some intensifying techniques that I used back then, and I still continue to use this day, which is probably still my best go-to intensifiers, the ones that I, I you know, teach in MI40 Foundation. Uh, MI40 Extreme was kind of the evolution of that because, you know, everybody goes, man, this is the best program. At MI40 Foundation was the best program I've ever done. I've learned so much. What's next? So the evolution of that for me was, you know, I literally spent three years or better part of two and a half years researching uh, ways to improve muscle building and it started with you know execution you got to master execution first otherwise everything else you do is useless and then um, finding some research done on quails which was the most obscure research I had ever found and all it was was Dr. Jose Antonio attached weights to quails wings and found that in this really short period of time he noticed 200% hypertrophy in the in the wing and so we started to go okay well how can this be applied and i was like so all it is is a stretch right they're stretching the muscle loaded stretch i was like well okay so is anybody else doing this and i was like well you know kind of there's a guy uh dante trudell who's doing like dog crap training which is kind of a loaded stretch but uh, i didn't believe that was the answer so what i started doing as i started experimenting uh with 
sh- loaded stretching. So Dante was doing loaded stretching between sets or, or heavy stretching between sets. I started doing loaded, loading, stre- loaded stretching during the set um, and then extending the set. So, cause I found some research that suggested if you end or yeah, if you end a exercise on a stretch, you can actually um, stimulate kind of a stretch response in the muscle, which actually tr- decreases its ability to contract. So I didn't want that to happen. So I wanted to increase its ability to contract. So I did the stretch. I, so I did my set and then I stretch and then I dropped the weight and I continued the set and I actually, you know, did a four um, step drop uh, with subsequently lighter weights. Uh, and I found it was just like the most excruciating thing when done correctly. Uh, and I found my muscle growth and my muscle pumps were just on a whole new level. The amount of lactic acid being produced was huge. And for those of you who don't know, lactic acid is massively correlated with growth hormone and fat loss. So you see all these kind of benefits. And so I literally went through the same thing for myself for almost six months. And this is while I was getting ready for the 2012 Arnold Classic, which is when I was got my best placing. Um, and then I had it immediately studied after the Arnold Classic in the University of Tampa. We did a six-week study where uh, we had 30 participants um, go through the study and averaged of 16 pounds of muscle gain in in six weeks. And that's just ridiculous, right? We're like, that is that are you, like you're right? You're checking the numbers. Um, so it was obscene. And uh, you know, the same group every day was there. We had a couple guys drop out because it was too hard. Um, but most guys made it through, and 16 pounds of weight gain in six weeks, you know, was just ridiculous. So, and we actually studied in a legitimate lab environment. We didn't control for nutrition. We, we gave them all a diet, and we said, you know, here's your calories, your caloric intake. Um, you know, follow that. And we, you know, we didn't know. There were some guys that knew they were getting the the right workout, and some guys that got a, a control workout. Um, and or the, sorry, they didn't know they were getting the workout. They didn't know what we were studying. But we got two separate groups. Uh, and that's what we saw, man. And, and it was the other group had gained like, you know, one and a half pounds or something like that in six weeks. Um, so it was pretty ridiculous. Um, and so that's what it was, man. It was that quadruple drop with the intercept stretch. And since then, there's been a ton of research on intercept stretching. Um, and I don't claim to have invented it by any stretch, but I invented the protocol. And, you know, obviously, Dr. Antonio was the guy who invented the stretch protocol, but I invented like the quadruple drop, which is what I call the cell expansion protocol. Uh, based around NOS Extreme. Um, so, yeah, it was hugely successful. I mean, uh, I think there's uh, 75,000 people who have uh, actively purchased the product, and then there's probably another 75,000 people who got it by, you know, passing it along down down the line, which, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so, but it's been a huge uh, life changer for myself and for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Actually, whenever I have a sticking point in a, in a muscle, I always use that NOS Extreme method because it's genius it it sucks to do at the time but it's 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 amazing yeah and it it works really well for specific exercises i don't recommend anybody try it on all exercises um but uh, if you can learn how to do it's not safe to do on certain ones but certain ones if you can make sure it's loaded properly in a safe way i don't think there's anything else that compares to the same amount of result with 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 the, the asterisk that um, you need to make sure your recovery ability is, is sufficient, right? You need to, you're going to be sore. You need to make sure that your uh, nutrition is on point, mm-hmm. which is all, again, I included all that in the program, how to eat to to accommodate for that. Exactly. Can you just explain a little more clear the uh, how that drop set works with the stretching? Yeah. So it's, um, you know, pick a weight you can do for 8 to 10 reps, and you want to get somewhere near failure, but not quite to failure. So I usually suggest picking a weight you can do for about 80%. Uh, so you're almost 80% of the weights of failure. And then you'll take it into the lengthened position. So we're doing a chest exercise. We take it to the lengthened position and find the maximum stretch. And you're going to hold that. And depending on your your capability, the duration can change. So for beginners, I say hold it for about 20 to 30 seconds in that stretch position. As soon as you're done, drop the weight, grab another weight, do eight repetitions, stop at the bottom. Again, do that 20 to 30 second stretch. Drop the weight, grab another weight. Again, eight repetitions, 20 to 30 second drop, again, fourth time, and then we finish on a contraction. And um, I mean, you've, you've experienced it. It's uh, it's excruciating. It's, I mean, it's probably the number one thing I did in 2012 to, um, to drive my success at the Arnold Classic. My body composition changed like that. Um, my weak body parts grew like that, like especially my back. I think it was, I think back might be the most perfect body part for it. Um, just because you can kind of get into a position where you're, you're, you know, braced on a bench, 
like with your chest against the bench and you can just really let that stretch or even this way it's just excruciating um you know works really well on chest works really well on biceps which is the video i give in the demonstration like it's excruciating you just gotta make sure you're doing it right there's slight variations of angles and stuff that i, I give all the execution videos mm -hmm. um so that brings us to the rapid fire questions at the end of every interview i ask every person that comes on the show the same questions um so basically the answers can be as long or as short as you like. So to start it out, what kind of things are you doing in your life right now to bring you happiness? Uh, every morning I wake up at 4.30, I, I uh, meditate and I read for an hour. Uh, starts my day off really well. I do some goal setting and some planning for the day. Um, I start a lot of yoga, so I do that. That, that brings me kind of peace, peace and serenity. And the true thing that makes me happy, man, is uh, every day. The reason I get up so early is I usually start work, um, you know, 7 a.m., 6 a.m. some days. Uh, and I work till about 2 p.m. And then I go home to my family. I spend the rest of the day with my kids. And we play baseball. We play hockey. We go in the pool. Um, you know, we, we do whatever it is that kids want to do. And, and uh, that's my greatest joy. You ever go to any lightning games? Often. My son is a massive hockey fan. Yeah? Is he a, a Leafs fan or is he a Tampa fan? He's a Penguins fan. Oh, he's Penguins. Are you a Penguins fan? Yeah, man. One of my best friends is the head trainer for the Penguins. So every time they're in town, we get to go to the practices. And in the dressing room, we went, I took him to Pittsburgh for his birthday this year. And we, and we went in the dressing room and he got a sign stick from Sydney. And he was, he was pretty pumped. Yeah, who wouldn't be? Sidney Crosby. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what would your profession be if you weren't in the fitness industry? Good question. If you would have asked me that 10 years ago, I don't know what I would have said, man. But now um, I'd like to be an author. I'd like to be a motiv motivational speaker, which I get the, the, the ability to do. And I get to travel and speak to people about my story and teach them about uh, exercise and nutrition and taking control of their life. Um, so that's probably what it is now, man. Awesome. If you were to buy your 20-year-old self two books, one fiction and one nonfiction, which would you give yourself? Oh, man. I, you know, two is too limited, man. I would buy I, – I honestly – so every time I read a book, I have a library of the ones that I want to keep and read again. And I want to – when my kid's 18, I want to hand him this library of books. Actually, when he's, when he's like 13 or 14, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bribe him and say, hey, read this book. And give me a book report on it, and I'll pay. I'll, I'll give you. I'll pay you or something, right? Because I want there's certain books like you just you just gotta put in kids' brains, man. So like there's so many that I don't even know. Uh, I, I like to read, man. I'm a, I'm a reader. I, when I'm not reading, I'm listening to audio books. I don't ever listen to music. It's always audio books. Um, man, I mean, there's so many that are cliche that everybody knows. I'm trying to think of one that maybe people don't know. Um, I'm reading one, I just finished one right now, is The Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. If anyone hasn't read that, it's kind of an obscure one, but that one's fantastic. Um, uh, fiction, and I don't read a lot of fiction anymore, to be honest. Um, Shakespeare, I think. Shakespeare. Yeah, only because it makes you think. I like it. So where can people find and follow you online? Uh, I'm actively on Instagram every day. Um, IFBB Ben Pack is my uh, Instagram handle. Uh, actually, maybe, yeah. And then my Facebook is Ben Pack IFBB. So same thing, but backwards. Um, I just signed up for Snapchat, but I don't think I'm ever going to use it because it seems like it's too complicated for my, my simple brain. I'm not much of a social guy. And if I didn't have to, have, if I didn't have kids, I wouldn't have a phone. I actually went about three months without a phone. It was the best three months of my life. Um, I just hate being attached to anything but uh so yeah social uh benpikulski.com actually is just about to relaunch it's it's up but we have a new site that's coming should be today uh hosting a new podcast so i have a, a podcast called the muscle expert podcast which i literally i'm very blessed in my life man i get to travel and learn from the brightest people in the world because of my platform and who i am um so i basically just leveraging all my great friends and we're having conversations about how we build muscle and how we make the most of our life and uh, how we master our mindset and you know, how we hack our biochemistry and, and all that cool stuff so it's pretty exciting man um you know i'm doing two a week now which uh it's honestly fun i wake up every day at 4 30 excited to get up and do it um, so I'm appreciative to be on here, man, because I know how much fun it can be, and uh, it, you know, I'm appreciative to, to introduce to be introduced to your audience. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming on. It's been an awesome show, and I loved your answers; they were great. Thanks, man.